Shall we pray? Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity to come and to worship you on this your holy day. Amen. Lord, we come with so many needs today, so many different needs. Lord, we know that you are the God that supplies all of our needs. And we just ask as we worship before you today that we will accept our worship, that you will understand the needs of our hearts, and that you will meet every need today. Forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, change us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Throughout this worship service, Lord, I pray that Jesus Christ will be lifted up in this place today. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.
the light print and if everyone will read the dark print after I'm done. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with the good things. He is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserves or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so love for those who fear him. As far as east from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. Pure. Think about that as we discuss God's word today. I'm going to thank the uh, deacons and those who helped move the uh, pulpit up here. I have to admit, I'm kind of a creature of habit. And it makes me feel kind of exposed to not be hiding behind this thing because I'm really, really nervous in front of people. <laughs> and so uh, they accommodated me, and I appreciate that. Please find a Bible this morning and open to the book of John, the eighth chapter. The Gospel of John, the eighth chapter. It was a feast of tabernacles, a holiday, a festive time, kind of like our Thanksgiving or even Christmas. People had come flocking to Jerusalem in celebration. Jerusalem was running over. People were sleeping everywhere, celebrating. And eventually, the inevitable. There was a moral compromise. The story is told here in John, the 8th chapter, verses 2 through 11. John, chapter 8, beginning with verse 2. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. They were excited. People usually are excited when there's a sex issue to be discussed. It happened at the temple. They all came together, the three parties, the sinner, her judges, and Jesus. Our situation as we come to worship this morning is not all that different. We too have come to the temple. We've come here to God's house, to the sanctuary. We come, some of us, feeling like sinners. Perhaps some of us feel like such sinners that we hardly dare show our faces. Or perhaps some of us come as judges. Some so respectable they cannot help but look down 
at the sinners. And we come together before Jesus. As we meet in worship this morning, sinners and judges and Jesus. I wonder what Jesus will do. That's what the Pharisees wanted to know. What will Jesus do? You see, they weren't really interested in the sin, and they weren't interested in the woman. What they were interested in was entrapping Jesus, and they had a foolproof trap. John chapter 8, verses 4 to 6. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. You see, there was apparently no way out for Jesus. It was clever because if Jesus said, stone her, Then they could run to the Romans and say, sedition, sedition. Only the Roman government has the right to inflict the death penalty. And look what this Jesus does. If on the other hand, he said, just let her go. Then they could throw up their hands and say, see there, he doesn't follow the books, the laws of Moses. He doesn't enforce the church manual. They had him no matter which way he turned. A perfect trap. What did Jesus do? Well, he didn't condemn and he didn't condone. Instead, he convicted and he converted. I'd like us to look this, look this morning at those four words. Jesus doesn't condemn sinners. He doesn't condone sin. Instead, he convicts and he converts. First of all, let's look at that word condemn. Christ does not condemn sinners. John, the 8th chapter in the 11th verse, she said, No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. There's the word condemn. Jesus does not condemn sinners. We find it so easy to criticize. We find it so easy to condemn. But criticism is not Christian. Criticism is a lot of things, but it is not Christian. Criticism is exciting. Criticism is self-exalting. It makes us feel superior. It makes our egos feel strong. Again, criticism is exciting. It's self-exalting. But criticism just isn't Christ-like, folks. Jesus said, neither do I condemn. But Christ does not condone sin. He doesn't condemn sinners, but he doesn't condone their sins. The Pharisees were hoping that maybe they could catch him condoning sin, disregarding the law of Moses. But the truth of the matter is that it was the Pharisees that condoned sin. Had you noticed that in this story? They condoned the sin in the man that committed adultery with the woman. An adulterous situation requires two people. They only brought one before Jesus. Why is it that they held the women so guilty and let the man go free? Leviticus 20.10 and the law of Moses says both parties shall surely be put to death. Both of them. They brought one. In essence, they condoned the man's sin and condemned the woman's sin. The 11th verse, the very last part, Jesus said, go and sin no more. Jesus said, sin no more. Jesus did not encourage sin. Jesus did not condone sin. Turn, if you will, to the book of Matthew. You might want to keep your place here in John chapter 8. We'll be coming right back to it. Matthew chapter 5. 
Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus' moral standard was very high. He did not condone sin. Jesus' moral standard was higher than Moses' standard, the one that they were so anxious to protect. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, verses 31 and 32. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Jesus' standard was very high. Jesus opposed divorce. The divorce standards of the church don't come from some red book. They don't come from the general conference. They come from the words of Jesus. Jesus' standards were very high. Jesus' standards went even farther than the Ten Commandments standards. Let's read that in Matthew chapter 5, up a few verses, verses 27 and 28. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus said that this whole business of moral sin does not begin externally, but internally. External sins are the ones that we criticize. External sins are the ones that we take to be so serious, but it is actually the internal sin that destroys us. I remember a number of years back, there was a car accident down at the corner. A lady in an old Plymouth ran through a red light, and two boys met her from the side in a Volkswagen Beetle. As you can imagine, the boys in the Volkswagen Beetle came out the worse for wear. When everything had stopped and they had taken care of everything in the accident, one of the boys had put his head almost completely through the windshield and blood began to pour, and it streaked down his face, and it looked oh so very serious. They put him in an ambulance, and they rushed him to the hospital, into the emergency room. And as they examined him, they found that there were no internal injuries that they could find, and so they cleaned him up, and they sewed up his scalp, and in an hour or two, he was on his way home, and never had another problem from it. It was about that same time that I visited a patient in that same hospital. And as I went to visit him, he sat up on the edge of his bed. He was able to get up and about, and he looked quite healthy to me. He hardly seemed sick at all. A few days later, I attended his funeral. Because you see, his problem was internal. The boy's problem was external. It seemed so serious because it was so obvious. Be very careful, dear fellow Christian, that we don't presume that the obvious is the most serious. It's the internal sin that destroys us. And Jesus said it was inside the life, inside the heart, inside the mind that lust and sin begin. Jesus hated sin. There's no merit in loving sinners if you love sin. Be very slow to vocalize the fact that you love sinners. It may be that it's simply because you like sin. There's no merit in loving sinners if you love sin. Jesus was not soft on sin. Jesus showed his strength when he was able to love sinners and yet hate their sins. Christ hates sin so much that he cannot overlook it. But Christ loves sinners so much that he cannot condemn. Christ hates sin so much that he cannot condone it. But Christ loves sinners so much that he cannot condemn. Neither do I condemn thee. Jesus neither condemns nor condones sin. Instead, he convicts and he converts. 
Notice as our story continues how he convicts. And you'll notice whom he convicts. The conviction wasn't so much directed toward the lady who had sinned. Those who are quite open in their sinning are quite aware of their sinfulness. The conviction was for those who were the critics. And maybe what the Lord wants to tell us as we meet in this temple this morning, that those of us who are judges need desperately to be convicted of our sin. The issue is not whether or not this woman had done wrong. As Jesus turned the tables, the issue became whether or not her accusers had the right to judge her, even if their charge were true. John, the eighth chapter, beginning in the middle of the sixth verse. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Boys and girls, did you know that this is the only time in the entire life of Jesus that we have any record that he wrote anything? Lots of things have been written about Jesus. We have the record of Jesus' words recorded in the four Gospels. But this is the only time it is recorded that he wrote anything. And those Pharisees and scribes must have been awfully happy that it wasn't kept to be put in the Bible. He that is without sin. Don't you see, sinners have never been authorized to judge the sins of others. I think we need to take it one step further this morning. I haven't the right to judge, I haven't the right to criticize, even if I express it in nice words. You know, as we become Christian and we try and grow in the love of Christ, the easiest thing for us to still think kind of nasty thoughts, but say them very kindly. As if I put the knife into you very gently, then that's somehow a more Christian act. Oh, we learn to cut up people so kindly, I wouldn't say anything about them that wasn't good, and boy, is this good. We judge, we criticize as if we had a love and a concern for the person. Dear fellow worshiper, if we loved him, if we were concerned for him, we wouldn't be saying it about him. Not if we loved him. To be in the presence of Christ is to be convicted of your own sins. John 8, verses 8 and 9. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Listen, did you know that the devil convicts us of sins? But you see, the devil always convicts us of other people's sins. The Holy Spirit always convicts us of our own sins. And the way you can tell whether you're listening to the devil or whether you're listening to the Holy Spirit, the devil always convicts us of other people's sins. The Holy Spirit always convicts us of our own sins. I'm inclined to think that criticism can be a very positive or very useful thing. Often, perhaps, it's the Lord who sends it. But when it comes from the Lord, it is to criticize ourselves, to help us see the sin in ourselves. If we are seeing just the sin in others, that kind of criticism cannot come from Christ. Christ does not condemn. One more word. Christ doesn't condemn sinners. Christ does not condone sin. Instead, he convicts and he converts. He convicts those who judge others. And I pray God that he will convict every one of us this morning of our tendency to judge others. And now we see that he converts those who are sinners. John 8 and verse 9. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone 
and the woman standing in the midst. Did you get the last part of that verse? Jesus was left alone with the woman. If you come to God's house this morning, a convicted sinner, before you leave this place of worship, you need to spend some time alone with the Savior. Surrounded by people, she had felt condemned. Alone with Jesus, she felt hope and she experienced forgiveness. She was converted. Desire of Ages, page 462, talking about this experience. The woman had stood before Jesus, cowering with fear. His words, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone, had come to her as a death sentence. She dared not lift her eyes to the Savior's face, but silently awaited her doom. In astonishment, she saw her accusers depart speechless and confounded. Then those words of hope fell upon her ear, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Her heart was melted and she cast herself at the feet of Jesus, sobbing out her grateful love and with bitter tears confessing her sins. This was to her the beginning of a new life, a life of purity and peace, devoted to the service of God. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. He cured the spiritual malady which is unto death everlasting. This penitent woman became one of his most steadfast followers. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she repaid his forgiving mercy. In his act of pardoning this woman and encouraging her to live a better life, the character of Jesus shines forth in the beauty of perfect righteousness. While he does not palliate sin, that means to lessen the seriousness of it, nor to lessen the sense of guilt, he seeks not to condemn but to save. The world had for this erring woman only contempt and scorn, but Jesus speaks words of comfort and hope. The sinless one pities the weakness of the sinner and reaches to her a helping hand, while the hypocritical Pharisees denounce Jesus bids her go and sin no more. All of this miraculous change because of one encounter alone with Jesus. Conversion brings hope, hope for the future. Verse 11 says, go. Don't let a mistake of the past, don't let mistreatment by other people make you stop. There is nothing you have done. There is no way that others have abused you that need to ruin the rest of your life. Don't stop there. Jesus said, go, move forward, go. You know something? In a way, we kind of like being criticized. Because then we can feel sorry for ourselves. And self-pity kind of leaves a warm glow. Brother A has abused me. Sister B won't speak to me. Brother C has cheated me. Poor old me. It's very natural to feel hurt and self-pity when other folks abuse us. But listen, it's also very hypocritical. Nothing makes us feel holier than criticizing people who criticize us. You've got to be on good ground there. Nothing makes us feel better than criticizing the people that criticize us. But listen, when you criticize the people who criticize you, you're getting in the same boat with them. And if you don't like the boat, what are you doing in it? Every person on earth, every person in our congregation today could tell a story probably just about as mournful, just about as tragic as your own. Don't ever forget that. Life is bound to hand you a lemon. You don't have any exclusive rights to misery. It's all part of living in this sinful world. 
Everybody gets a lemon now and then. You can simply count on it. It's just up to you what you're going to do with that lemon. You can sit there the rest of your life all puckered up, sucking on the lemon, turning sour. Don't presume that you're the only one that is criticized, you're, that you're the only one that gets hurt. It happens to everybody. The question is, what do we do when it happens? The same lemon, a different use, add a little sugar and make lemonade. Christ provides the sugar. He provides the sweetness. Oh, let the sweetness of Jesus' love help you overcome the hurts of life. And then through you, help to sweeten the lives of others. Love like Jesus loves you. And so Jesus shares a tremendous lesson through this story today. You wouldn't catch Christ condemning sinners. Then Christians, those who pattern their lives after Christ, ought not to be caught doing it either. But neither could Christ condone sin. Jesus was not soft on sin. Instead, he convicts us of our sins and he converts us from our sins. May I ask you today in your relationship with other people, are you a restorer like Jesus was? Or are you a destroyer like the Pharisees? The last paragraph of that chapter detailing this woman's story, Desire of Ages, page 462. Those who are forward in accusing others and zealous in bringing them to justice are often in their own lives more guilty than they. Men hate the sinner while they love the sin. Christ hates the sin but loves the sinner. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. Christian love is slow to censure, quick to discern penitence, ready to forgive, to encourage, to set the wanderer in the path of holiness and to stay his feet therein. Oh, dear fellow worshiper, when the church establishes itself as a place of healing and not as a place of judgment, the sin sick will come to the church. Now, I have had a broken bone only once in my life. It just happened to come on my 50th birthday. You know, you hit 30, you say, how does it feel being 30 now? Ah, big deal. How does it feel when you hit 40? Big deal. 50, I thought I was going to say the same thing. Well, that kind of kicked me in the butt. I broke my arm on my 50th birthday. So yeah, that was sort of like, hello, I'm 50 now. I was still working at the post office and I was working on a Sunday. And I worked, uh, fortunately, in my career, I was always able to get Sabbaths off by working Sunday. Just a skeleton crew, that was me. One person, I always worked by myself on Sunday. After I broke my arm on my birthday, I didn't work by myself on Sunday anymore. But I had just unloaded the truck driver early in the morning when he came with all the mail for the day. And he was going to take a break and go eat breakfast and take a walk and come back to his truck when it was time in about four hours to load the truck up and send the outgoing mail up to Tucson. And I noticed when he left, after he had left, that he had left his lights on. And I had no idea how long his lights would last, if he would be perfectly fine with that, or if for some reason it wasn't going to start, you know, if it was going to drain the battery down. I really didn't know. I didn't have much experience with trucks or anything. And I thought, well, i got to make sure the mail gets out. I don't want to delay it by any... by you know, having a dead battery or anything. So I really should do something. And I climbed up into the cab. And I mean, this is, I'd never been up in a cab of a truck before. I mean, that's way, nine feet, thank you. I was wondering how far it was, but it was a long ways up. And I think the reason I had an accident was because probably the oxygen was a little thin up there <laughs> because it was like climbing way up there. And I'm like, whoa, and this is a whole new world to me. It was like being you know, a switchboard operator in the old days for AT&T or something. Like, doo, 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 doo. I got all these buttons and switches and everything. 
What do they go to? How do I get the lights off? I was fiddling with a few switches, so I was up there for a couple of minutes. Finally, it looked like this was probably be the one, and I went to swing myself out of the truck and totally forgot where I was in that moment. It's like I was stepping out of my car, maybe my pickup truck, but suddenly I was just on the ground. Bang! On the asphalt. And I hit on my hip, and I'm very fortunate, praise God, that I didn't break my hip, because that took the brunt of it and also my arm. And I broke the radial head of my arm. And I didn't feel a lot of pain for a little bit because I was just stunned, you know, something that just hits you out of the blue like that. You're just kind of disoriented, like, how did that happen? And I finally got to my senses and got up and looked around. I made sure nobody else was watching, of course. You got to do that first. Okay, okay, there are no witnesses. I'm cool. And so I stayed there for several hours, and I tried to work through the pain. And the longer I worked, the more painful it was, and I just happened to be working on spreading, sorting packages, so it was putting a lot of weight on the fracture. And the pain just got worse, very severe pain. And so I knew I at least had to have it checked out, and so I called my wife. And Sandy drove that 25 minutes to the post office to pick me up and take me to the hospital, which was about 25 seconds away from where I worked. But it was so comforting to have somebody with me who sympathized with me, who understood what I was going through, who didn't laugh at me for my klutziness and falling down and breaking my arm, who stayed with me for the four and a half hours or so that I spent waiting in the emergency room lobby, who held my good hand and loved me unconditionally. Amazing love. And then we finally entered the emergency room. And as we entered the emergency room, another astounding thing happened. Not a single doctor, not a single nurse stood around gawking with their mouth hanging open. Oh, looky, looky, look what happened here. Get a load of this guy. Not one single person ever did lecture me for falling out of the truck. I got that from my boss later. And they were gentle. And they took x-rays of the fracture. And they made a splint. And they cradled my arm in a sling. And they gave me some wonderful little pain pills. Friends, sometimes hospitals do their work better than churches do. Hospitals are good news because they're places where the pain stops and where the healing starts. Oh, dear church family, isn't that what the church is all about? Should this be a place where we stand around gawking at the wounds that are hurting other people? Is this a place where we reprimand people for having fallen down? The Pharisees that came to Jesus hoped that he would pick up a stone and throw it at that awful sinner. Instead, Jesus picked up the sinner. What do you pick up? When somebody has made a mistake, do you pick up stones? Or do you pick up people? Let's go out of church today with a determination to pick up people because that's what Jesus does. Shall we pray? Our dear loving Father in heaven, today my prayer is that we will each one turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Lord, we all have the tendency to be judges, condemning other people. Lord, those of us who are tempted to judge, and we all have that temptation, 
Help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus and to love people the way that Jesus loves us, the way that he showed us his love is like. Lord, those of us who have fallen, and we all do that, those of us today who are sinners, may we each one leave this place of worship today clean and pure through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. May we take all our sins, as our scripture reading said, as far as the east is from the west, into the depths of the sea. May we walk out of here changed and clean and free. Lord, whenever we see somebody that's hurting, may we ignore the temptation to pick up a stone. Instead, Lord, may we pick up the person because that's what you're like. Help us, each one, to love like you love us is my prayer in Jesus' loving name. Amen.